All right. Well, it's good seeing everyone here. It's been a, a kind of a kind of a strange week. It's been beautiful on some days and then freezing cold on others. So who knows what tomorrow will be like? We might have palm trees growing in our front yard. So I don't know. But uh, it's it's good seeing all of you here and. Uh, for our visitors, we're thankful for you as well. If you need anything, uh, know that we're here for you. We care about you. We want uh, heaven to be your home, and we want, want to help you in any way possible, uh, physically speaking as well, if you need that. Uh, we're in Ephesians chapter 1 uh, this morning, and we're getting to chapters 5 through 6, which are uh, tied together with verses 3 and 4, as we've looked at over the last uh, three weeks up to this point. And the Apostle Paul has so far been talking about uh, Christ. He's been talking about the church. He's been talking about Christ's blessings upon the church. And really, the core of what Paul has been saying so far is expressing the idea that you and I as believers are saved solely by God's grace. Uh, we're not saved because of our works. We're not saved because of our race. We're not saved because of who we are as people. Uh, because who we are as people is not worthy of salvation in the first place. Uh, but what, what he starts doing is he begins to talk about the church. And he talks about our calling uh, from the gospel to Christ. Is, is really this very fact that you and I need to appreciate the fact that we are solely saved by God's love, by God's grace, and by God's care for this creation. And so verses 3 and 4 have really adopted this idea. Uh, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has blessed us in Christ, the source of all blessings, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And as we've seen, the church is part of those heavenly places. It's a spiritual place. It's not a, a physical building, uh, but it's made up of people who serve as temples of God. In verse 4, as we saw last week, uh, he chose us in Him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Now, again, as we saw last week, there's a lot of debate as to what Paul means here, and we don't need to get into that discussion. Uh, but again, the, the core of what Paul is arguing is that Israel was elected by God as a special people, not because of their size, not because of their number, not because of their morals, but they were chosen solely because of God's choice. And he makes that same application to the church. The church is not chosen because of who we are as individuals. The church is chosen because of who God is as a gracious, loving Father. And so the purpose of our predestination, the purpose of our election, is that we should be holy and blameless before Him. And that's what we've seen so far. Uh, we have been called to worship God. We have been called in love. We have been called out of grace and only grace. And so we have no grounds for boasting. We have no grounds for thinking of ourselves as superior to other people because we are all sinners just like everyone else. And so the call of the gospel is not to try and save ourselves through works, through merit, or through morality. The call of the gospel is to place our faith and our trust in Christ and allow Christ and his power to change us into creatures after his own image. Well, this then takes us to chapter 1, verse 5. And here Paul brings up the idea of adoption, another blessing that we have in Christ. And, and we read beginning at verse 5, and technically I, I guess we should say at the end of verse 4, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And so we've learned from the Apostle Paul very simply, very clearly, that every spiritual blessing is found in Christ. Salvation can't be found in any other name. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. All men, Jew and Gentile, must turn to Christ, not to themselves, for their salvation. And Paul has expounded on this truth by explaining what these blessings are. We saw what the blessing of election entails, and so we won't get back into that. But now we're going to look at the second blessing that we find in Christ, and this is the blessing of adoption. Now this is worthy of a treatment in and of itself because the doctrine of adoption, the idea of us being adopted to God, has several implications as to who we are as sinners, the separation that sin causes, and how we become, rather than children of God, we become children of the devil, children of the earth, and we begin to serve our own lusts and our own desires rather than the things of God. All of this is a part of adoption. And when we think about the idea that we are adopted by God, if, if any of you are familiar with adoption, maybe some of you have adopted children, you recognize adoption is a gift. 
If a child is in need of adoption, they generally are not in a place that's ideal. Maybe they're in an orphan home. Uh, maybe they're in a children's home. Maybe they're in a, a home in which the state had to take them away from their parents because of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and these things. And these children are in need of great help, aren't they? They come from broken homes very often. They carry many different problems in their own lives. And it, what, a, what a great blessing and privilege it is to have Christians, to have believers in the household of God, take them in as one of their own, right? To raise them up in the faith, to care for them, to recognize the problems that they might have had, and to try and help them work through those problems. Uh, you know, th these, are, these are things that really just bring about uh, the, the sin in our world and, and the various problems. And so adoption is a gift. Those of us who have been through it, those of us who have experienced it, and those of us who have adopted recognize uh, that fact. But the fact that you and I are adopted by God is also a very humbling truth. Because what this teaches us is it teaches us what our original state was before God redeemed us. That before we were saved by the grace of God, we were not children of God, we were not sons of God, but we were sons of the devil. And so in this lesson, we're going to see why we needed to be adopted, why we were adopted, and what we do now that we are adopted by God. And so let's first of all see this first point, the need for adoption. Uh, why exactly can we call our spiritual adoption by God a gift, a blessing? How does this tie together with the fact that in Christ every spiritual blessing is found? Well, this takes us back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 2, and Genesis chapter 3. As we look at man's original state, who did God make man to be? Well, we realize that when God made Adam and Eve, when they were first created, they held the full right of being called God's children. God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and, and in what image did God make man? In the image of God. He formed man from the dust of the earth, but he didn't make them after the image of the dirt. He made them after his own image. Now, what does it mean that man was made in the image of God? Well, it means that not only was man created with reason, with logic, with skill, but they were infused with the divine spirit. They were holy. They were righteous. They were just. They were under what we might say is a covenant of works, in that Adam and Eve's salvation was found in living out their lives perfectly because sin had not yet come into the world. And so they were made in God's image. And if we look at our own children on this earth and we say, you know, they really take up your image, what are we saying? They share a lot of your same attributes. They look a lot like you. They act a lot like you. They talk a lot like you. They're made in your image. You're, you're their spitting image. And so it was with man when they were first created. They were holy. They were innocent. Uh, according to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, they were given a very high position over the creation to subdue the earth. And we also see in the creation accounts that man in his original state, in his perfect state, before sin came into the world, he had a very great potential when it came to success, when it came to, uh, when it came to dominating the earth, subduing the earth, and even when it came to wisdom. They had access to what? The tree of life. Eternal life. Now, now, for those of you who've walked the face of this earth longer than I certainly have, you realize you pick up a lot of things the older you get, don't you? You learn a lot of things. Well, imagine what human potential could be if we lived on this earth forever. If you didn't have to worry about the clock expiring. Pick up any book, spend however long you want to memorize it word for word, learn any kind of truth that you want to discover, Man's potential would be unlimited by that point. And we think about, for example, in the creation, how God brings all of the animals to Adam for Adam to name those animals. Now, for, for, for many of us, we probably struggle to remember our own names, more or less to name every single creature that walks the face of this earth. But you see in man before the fall, great wisdom, great power, great intellect, great reason. Things that we couldn't even picture doing today. But then sin comes into the picture, and we see the original state of man become corrupted and fallen. In man's fallen state, we see that Adam and Eve's sin destroys the natural order of things. 
When you go and, and you look through God's curse on, on the serpent, on the man, and on the woman, there's also a fourth curse there that, that many times we don't pick up on. God looks at the ground, and what does he do? He curses the ground to where thistles, briars, death, and decay come into the world. And the Apostle Paul speaks of this in Romans chapter 8 as well. That not only did sin impact man, our souls, but it disrupted the entire created order, the entire creation, so that it groans with eager waiting for the redemption of our bodies. As a result of the fall, God's image in man was greatly tainted. Our, our reason, our consciences, our obedience, our endeavors, they all became hindered by sin. And as sin comes into the world, what did we do? Did we look at the sin in that, of Adam and say, you know what, we're going to learn from that and I'm going to live a perfect life? You know, can, can, can any single one of us in here say we are perfect? No. Not a single human being except the Son of God himself can say that he has lived out the law perfectly. And so the Apostle Paul would say in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, a key text is Romans chapter 5, where the Apostle Paul in chapter 5, verse 12, would say that just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, the Apostle Paul then adds to that, death spread to all men. And what's the reason for that? Because we were born in sin? No. He says, all have sinned. We have all shared in the sin of Adam. We've all tasted the forbidden fruit, no matter what shape it took. And as a result, we have all suffered the consequences of that fall in the garden, and we imbued upon ourselves the wrath of God. And so we might say with Paul in Romans chapter 7, verse 9, I was, uh, I was alive, I was a child of God before the law, before I knew right from wrong. But when the commandment came, when my knowledge of good and evil, my rationality was matured, sin became alive and I died. And what the Apostle Paul here is saying is that each and every one of us, as we came out of that womb, we were an innocent creature. But the minute you and I began to understand right from wrong, what did we choose? We chose to do what was wrong. And as a result, we cease to become children of God, and instead we become children of Satan. And therefore, we're in need of adoption. And let's think about it this way. I'm just going through the works of Paul, the works of John. Here's how we're described before we come to faith in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. We were by nature children of wrath. Not children of God, children of wrath. We were children of the world destined for God's wrath. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, the Apostle John would say that we were children of the devil. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, the Apostle Paul says that before Christ transferred us out and placed us into his kingdom, we were a part of the domain of darkness. And with John chapter 8, verse 4, and sometimes we need to be careful not to stick up our noses at the Pharisees, because we all shared in Phariseeism in some point. But he says that the Pharisees were sons of the devil. They were of their father, the devil. And we're all equally sinners like the Pharisees. We all transgressed just like they did. And so our father was Satan. We, we desired to do what our father loved, and we love to do what God abhors. Our consciences, our morality, our reason was defiled by sin. And yet we still, despite all of this, have an eternal hope. Again, Ephesians chapter 1. Adoption is a part of the blessings we have in Christ. And in love, we read that God predestined us for adoption to himself through who? Jesus Christ. Despite the fact that we did everything in our power to hate God, to mock Him, to turn on Him, to despise what's good and love what is evil, 
God still decided to send his son. Because all people are born under that old Adam, and all people have sinned. Not a single person on this earth can receive God's favor. No one who has ever walked the face of this earth, born of man, can rightly be called God's children. And so what does God do? Well, Romans chapter 5 gives us the answer. Because we followed after the old Adam, God sent the new Adam. He sent Jesus Christ to revert the consequences of that fall. He says in verse 17 of Romans chapter 5 that if because of one man's trespass, the sin of Adam, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through who? Through the one man, Christ Jesus. Therefore, as one trespass, the fall in the garden, led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness, Jesus' death on the cross, it leads to justification in life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased... Grace abounded all the more. The more we sinned, the more God had to forgive. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So so Paul picks up on this. Sin has separated us from God. It's made us children of Satan, children of the devil, children of the world. God sees man as his enemy, as recipients of his wrath, and yet still in love, he said, I'm going to send my son to save them. We tried pulling away, we tried fighting as much as we could against our almighty father, and yet the more we tried to pull away, the more God pulled us in. And because of Christ's death, because of his atoning sacrifice, He gives us the spirit of adoption at our conversion. Uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 15 brings this up. When are we adopted? When do we cease being children of Satan and we become children of God? Well, Romans 8 8, 8 verse 15 gives us the answer. He says, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You recognize the point here that Paul's making? What is it that brings us back to God? Well, when we're converted, what does God give us? He gives us His Holy Spirit. And it's the indwelling of the Spirit in the body of the believer. His sanctifying work, His sanctifying power, His regenerating ability. That we then cease to be children of Satan and we become children of God. That's the moment of our adoption. This then takes us to the cause of our adoption. Why did God adopt us? Why did he choose to save a sinner like me? Going back to the end of verse 4, which is tied to verse 5, he did this in love. In love he predestined us for adoption. We are saved solely through the love of God. We're not saved by our works We're not saved by our self-righteous acts. The only reason we have been adopted is because God loves us. We just uh, sung a song before the Lord's Supper, because he loved me so. That's the answer to all the whys that we have in the Christian faith. Why did God do this? Because he loved me so. Why did God send his son? Because he loved me so. Why did God adopt a, a wretched sinner like me? Because he loved me so. Because he loved the God-haters, he adopts us and places us into his kingdom. This is the core of the gospel message. God loved the world, John 3.16. God so loved the world. God so loved the sinful, rebellious, wicked, God-hating world. 
to such, the po- to such a point that he sent his son. And if we recognize this fundamental truth, then we have obtained for ourselves the solution to all fears, all worries, and all pride. And as a result of learning and appreciating the love of God, we are then impacted and shaped ourselves as people of love. 1 John 4, 19, we love because what? He first loved us. We love each other not because of ourselves, but because God first loved us. We love our wives not because of how good we are, but because God first loved us. We love the church not because we're more holy than other people, but because God first loved us. Recognizing the fact that we are saved solely by grace and solely through God's love is not something that gives us an opportunity to sin. It's something that ceases sin. Because we recognize God is gracious, God is good, and why would I ever do anything that insults and defiles his holy, magnificent name? And this then brings us to the final point, the purpose of of our adoption. The Apostle Paul, at the end of verse 5, he says that we were adopted according to the purpose of his will. And very often we have to ask the question, what is that purpose? Well, well, here Paul gives us the answer in verse 6. The purpose of his will for adopting us as sons is this, that we obtain the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. Why has God adopted us sinners? He has adopted us so we can praise his glorious grace. That's what you're in here for. That's what you're a Christian for. You are a Christian because you have recognized that you are saved by God's grace, solely by his grace, and now you and I want to spend every minute, every second of our lives, praising the name of God for the salvation that he has freely given. That's the transforming power of this Christian gospel. Our calling and our purpose solely is to glorify and honor God in our lives. Now, we fulfill this in two vital ways, and I guess this is where the application of this fundamental truth comes in. We fulfill this purpose, first of all, individually, right? We don't just worship God in the building. We don't just worship God an hour of the week. We worship God every minute of every day. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul would say that our bodies are a living sacrifice. And it's by our bodies, which are indwelt by God's Holy Spirit, that we then offer up to God spiritual worship. Our minds are directed to the grace and the goodness and the power of God. Our lives and our conversations with people reflect the love of God in our lives. And therefore, we don't go around gossiping, speaking malice and hate. But rather, we go speaking words that are seasoned with grace. And so our lives individually are meant to be lives that glorify and honor God. But also, there's a a twofold chord to this. Not only are we called to do this individually, we're called to do this corporately, as a church, as a body of believers. And so we're here together as one people, under one gospel, under one faith, having been baptized by one baptism, that corporately together as one body, we magnify the name of God as well. And thus the Apostle Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, for example, speaking of the church, that we're to be addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. We're doing this all as one, one body. In Psalm chapter 22, verse 22, which really the book of Psalms, a worship manual in many ways. He says, I will tell of your name to my brothers, and in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And so as we think about this, we think about the individual form of worship, the individual purpose of our calling, of our adoption, and we think about the corporate purpose of our adoption. We just ask up this word as a word of encouragement to you and a word of application to you. Have you been living up to your adoption? Have you given up your life to God fully? 
in which you see every single day, not as something for you, but as something to glorify and honor God? Do you see this in your careers? Do you see this in your conversations? Do you see this in your entertainment? Do you treat your body as a living sacrifice for the God who died for you? Have you given your life over as an act of constant worship and reverence? Well, Christians, let's live in keeping with that adoption. Let's give ourselves over to holiness, obedience, and worship. And if it's the case that you are not a Christian, and you've not yet accepted the love of God, and at this moment you're still a child of this world, turn to Him, be saved from this corrupt generation, receive Him, Receive his grace, receive his love, and let God save you. And we can help you any way as we can to turn you to God, to teach you the gospel, and to make sure that you get to heaven with us as together we stand and as we sing.